Nathan, could you tell us, in your view, um, how you see the future of the health system going in Australia and obviously around the world? Well, I'm a futurist, so I study futuristic technologies. Um, and a lot of technologies are developed by two bodies, two, two areas, two professions. A lot of it's developed by the military and a lot of it's developed by the health system. A lot of the groundbreaking technologies that come out. So I've looked at, and a lot of new groundbreaking technologies are considered medical breakthroughs. So in my quest for knowledge of the future, I've looked a bit into gene editing and genetic engineering. And that's what really concerns me is these, these technologies that have the ability to change what we are as humans, you know. Um, sometimes I think it comes across like, like health has this direction of taking us towards a superior species, some sort of master species. Because if you think about what they are going to do, what they're saying these technologies will be able to do, you know, people will be able to live for hundreds of years um, they won't ever be able to catch a cold. They won't ever be able to catch a flu or get cancer. You know, they'll be immune to all these diseases. And that's fantastic, you know. Give me the needle that makes me immune to cancer. I want it. Give me the needle that makes me live for 500 years. You know, I want it. Give it to me. Um, but then some other things concern me, you know, when you start... Because it's, it's a philosophical discussion about what is perfect, um... And perf perfection is subjective to the individual deciding what they view as perfect. So, you know, the health system's bringing in all these groundbreaking technologies where we can edit out autism, we can edit out schizophrenia, we can edit out bipolar, we can edit out um, Asperger's, you know. And then what are we left with? So, so who gets edited out of the population now? Now, a doctor would say, oh, but you are not your autism. That is, a dis that is a disorder you have. Or they would say, you are not your schizophrenia. That is a disorder you have. We want to edit out that part of you. Well, what if I say, I am my schizophrenia? What if I say, I am my bipolar, and it's an integral part of who I am, and then it, it adds to my personality and my individuality? So, you know, what concerns me about moving towards gene editing in particular is that doctors are already putting all these people into all these categories you know psychiatry is going berserk with categorizing half the population with having disabilities so we're putting all these boxes people into all these boxes of bipolar schizophrenia asperger's and all these different conditions that apparently everybody has and it's like these are the people they're going to edit out of the gene pool when they can do it. And, you know, that technology's less than 100 years away. You know, it's, it's less than 100 years away that we'll be able to get out an embryo before it's born um, and edit out any deficiencies. But what is a deficiency, you know? Isn't it a bit subjective? Um, I, I view bipolar people as highly creative. I believe that, and I believe there will be evidence emerging in the future to say that people with bipolar are naturally creative and open-minded people. Um, so I don't view bipolar as a disability needing to be edited out of the gene pool. I view it as a, a creative condition which can be seen as a benefit and an attribute which is positive. So, you know, I'm not satisfied with the direction the health system is taking us because they're, they're going around and they're all throughout the Western world where, where the, this health structure is in place. They're profiling populations. They're putting people into boxes. And it's just, it's also eugenics, you know. It's just eugenics thinking, you know. And these are all the people they want to edit out these conditions and make them perfect, you know, in this pursuit of perfection. Well, I think perfection is subjective and I think that people are beautiful for who they are uh, and that we should cherish each individual. And I also value diversity in the population, you know. It's like sometimes I think, you know, some people, are, uh, they think this way. They want to homogenise everyone. They want to conform everyone to how they want them to be. They, you know, I think health experts want to tell us what normal is. You know, and I don't believe in this idea of normal. You know, I accept there's a place 
for some social norms, but really I reject any idea of normal. I'm an individualist. I believe we're individuals. We all have a unique personality and a unique perspective. So it just all comes across as eugenics to me. And when I think about what I know about genetic engineering and where that's going to go in the future, I just think the profiling everybody into these groups, you have this disorder, you have that disorder, and we're just going to genetically modify um, everyone like you out of the gene pool, leaving our superior master species of um, people who live for hundreds of years and can't get any disease and are absolutely perfect by your subjective definition of perfect. So, so yeah, I do think sometimes it's like the health profession in general, experts within the health sector doing this research, I think they're eugenicists. I think it's all about superiority. It's all about uh, who has superior genes. And, you know, these people are scientists, so they're into natural selection. And that's okay. I acknowledge that nature works through natural selection. I don't deny natural selection. You know, superior genes and competitive genes thrive and other genes die. But this is how these people think. And it's not a very compassionate perspective. It's a perspective of saying this group of people are superior and supreme and these people all have deficiencies. And when we have the ability to gene edit people, we're just going to get rid of all these people. So, you know, it comes across like something the Nazis would do. So um, that's my view on the direction of, of gene editing and... And, and gene manipulation. Um, I, but I do acknowledge that gene editing is a powerful tool which is going to heal suffering. So I'm really ultimately conflicted about gene editing because gene editing can heal suffering. You know, if we can edit people so they don't get cancer, well, great. You know, we don't want people getting cancer. We want to edit people so they don't get cancer. If we want to edit people so they can't get the flu, edit their genes so they can't get the flu, then fantastic, edit their genes so they can't get the flu. You know, but we have to think... And the thing that's important to me is that all this research is being conducted um, and only lawmakers are discussing the ethics of this stuff. Now, I've read some textbook material about the ethics of gene manipulation and gene editing, um, and I, I want the discussion to be more public and to involve more people in the community because I know there's a lot of people who get very uncomfortable about these ideas about creating superior humans who are uh, who are perfect in this subjective sense can't get illness can't get disease live for hundreds of years now we all have a right as a community to say whether we want this research to go ahead and this research is going ahead and it has huge implications for the direction of our species you know brain chips are the other technology which is a medical technology which also has really scary military applications but brain chips are a medical technology and again i acknowledge that brain chips have the potential to heal people and to improve quality of life um well, i read an interesting article by an academic which said when, when the brain chip comes in, we're going to need new regulations and laws to protect people's cognitive liberty. And what she means by that is if, 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 if it's possible with a person who has a brain chip to manipulate their thoughts and to program them to think a certain way, well, we need laws and regulations when the brain chip comes out that make sure that no state or other um, body has the ability to hack into a person's mind and rearrange their thinking, especially businesses seeking to market content straight into people's heads. Um, the thing I think about the brain chip is whenever... See, I reckon in 150 years, 90% of the human population is going to have these brain chips. And the reason I think that is because when the cell phone came out, there was all these people who rejected this technology and said, you know, this is going to enslave us to technology. Everybody can't live without their cell phone now. We can't live without our mobile phones. And in 150 years, everyone's going to have the brain chip and they're not going to know how to live without it. Inf and I do think information technology like this can be powerful. It can increase knowledge and intelligence. But there are concerns about the brain chip. Um... Um, and there are concerns that people will lose their individuality. And, you know, what if everyone who's networked with the brain chip suddenly starts to think the same as each other, you know? So 
know, when we talk about health, we have to talk about futuristic technologies that are really going to transform humanity. And I'm concerned about the direction some of these health technologies will take our species, and we have a right to have a say in that.